Greetings and salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, as always, Judo Dave Roman. What's going on, everybody? I'm very excited to be back behind the microphone once again to talk all things judo. I've got a special guest on this particular episode. It's a it's an interview. I actually conducted this interview earlier in the week, but I'm going to splice it in like I always do for interviews and, and edit it down and make sure that you guys find it interesting. I have an interview with the the coaching director for USA Judo, Serge Boiso, and I, I got to tell you, I, I can't wait to play it. I'm really excited for you guys to listen to this, this interview because I... I was so impressed with Serge. I, I was almost speechless. Me. Me of all people speechless on my own podcast. Just listening to Serge about the things he's doing with his club, his history, and what he's doing with USA Judo and what he sees USA Judo doing over the next year or the next couple of years. I don't know if you guys had a chance to see some of the financials that USA Judo recently put out. They're definitely going in the right direction financially. Now, granted, their their profit and loss statement did show a profit, which is great. It's good to see USA Judo in the black. Uh, my only feeling when I saw that particular document is that it left a lot of room for interpretation. And I, I didn't find that particular document very detailed as I've seen in years past. But you know what? I'm I'm not going to I'm not counting that as a strike. That's not a necessarily a bad thing. All I'm saying is that I wish I saw a little bit more. But at the end of the day, it really looks like USA Judo is trying to mend the relationship between the membership and they are really trying to right the ship and and I I really believe this and I think once you listen to this interview that I conducted earlier in the week, I think you guys within the United States are going to really see and really believe that there are many good things in store for USA Judo in the future. Now, before I get to all of that, there's a few housekeeping things as always. You guys know how I like to do things around here on this podcast. There's a few housekeeping things that I want to take care of, things I like to talk about. I know about a week ago I said, or maybe two weeks ago, I said that there may be a missing podcast. Well, I'm hoping to cover my bases here so that there isn't a, a week gone by where I'm not able to drop a podcast. So I know last week or two weeks ago, I said there may not be a podcast for this particular Monday, uh, but I'm going to, I'm, I managed to get this uh, with, with the interview with Serge and next weekend I'm, I'm planning on having an, uh, another podcast drop interviewing for the first time, somebody who's a Q rank. Now I, I wanted to do this because, well, one, this particular fellow wanted to be interviewed by me on the podcast, which I think is super awesome. But I wanted to get structure this in a way where we get the kind of the higher level response of what some people think is going on with USA Judo or Judo in the United States. And then I wanted to get a different response from somebody who is, I, I, I hate to use the word lower level, but maybe somebody who's less experienced than a lot of the guests I've had in the past. So I want to get two contrasting uh, opinions on what people think about judo and this my my guest next week I won't reveal him just yet but he's a young fellow who who not only trains in the United States he also has a lot of experience training in Canada it's it's interesting to me to to hear uh, some of those contrasting differences so I'm going to have that particular interview drop next Monday so that there won't be any sort of gap and then hopefully uh in the following week I'm planning on interviewing a fellow, I know some of you out there know him. Uh, his name is uh, Chris Round. He's coming out with a book called Four Days in London. I'm very interested to hear about that and hear about some of his training experiences. He's been uh, around the world as far as I know, and, and he's trained at uh, uh, with Jimmy Pedro and a lot of other high-level talent. So he, he knows a lot of people in the judo community at the, at the uh at the elite level, so I'm very interested to hear his story because I, I I'm familiar with him a little bit, and I know he's got a lot to tell about his experiences with judo and this particular book project that he's doing. So I'm trying to schedule that and find a proper time to interview him. I really can't wait for that, and and I'll be sure to let you guys know when that particular interview drops as well. 
I just got a tweet from judoinside.com and there is an interesting article that was just posted on judoinside.com's website. And the title of this article says, Survey Proves Judo Needs Prevention Programs Against Knee Injuries. So I'm going to read this. It's a short article, but I think you guys will find this very interesting. So here it goes. Former judoka Ralph Okoto and Christopher Lambert did research on judo injuries. Judo Inside contributed with a bit, uh, contributed a bit with some data, but both doctors now published their survey and summarized the essence of their research where knee injuries are the most common reason why judoka might even retire or lose power after getting back. We should show that ACL rupture followed by vertebral disc prolapse were common injuries for judo players and especially to these two injuries led to long longest time loss in sporting performance reduction compared to other common judo injuries. The ACL rupture is a common injury in judo. After an ACL rupture, some judokas came back as if nothing had ever been, like Old Bischoff, who suffered an ACL rupture and became Olympic champion one and a half years later after the ACL surgery, or Andre- Andreas Tolzer, who was two times runner-up at the World Championship and Olympic bronze medalist after he had ACL surgery. But not always it goes so well in these cases. Until now, it is not clear how many judokas suffer ACL injuries, how long it takes to come back, and if they manage to bring the same performance as before the injury. A recent published study uh, of 4,659 judoka were asked about the injuries they suffered in their career. Among other things, they were asked how long they needed to come back to judo and if they came back on the same performance level. Uh, The ACL ruptures were reported by nearly 10% of all judokas who took part in the study among uh, among judokas with natural international performance level. The the proportion was 14%. Let's see. ACL ruptures were the most severe injury type with the largest proportion of judoka with long-time interviews until they came back and reduced performance level after coming back. 32% of judoka needed nine months or more until they came back. Only 32% reached the same level of performance after they came back. 29% reported a strongly reduced performance level or even stopped judo altogether. Sports-specific injury prevention programs against knee injuries have been successfully introduced in other sports with a high rate of ACL ruptures like soccer or handball. This study showed that also in judo, prevention programs against knee injuries are needed. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I Look, <laughs> I'm not a doctor, obviously. I don't even play one on TV or on a podcast. I have been very, very lucky compared to some of the stories I have heard from other uh, people that have been involved in judo. I've managed to be injury-free in my knees. The only real issues I've had in judo are because of my shoulder, which was my fault. And I've got a a couple of permanently torn uh, hamstring muscles, which were also my fault. I have known a bunch of people with knee injuries. And I think the common theme with all of those particular knee injuries is that from everybody that I've known, they've been caused by other people. Now, you... As a recreational player, I know my own limits and I know what I can and can't do that are going to prevent or or that are going to cause injuries to other people. Now, I've I've hurt people in the past during Rondori, but I've never caused a knee injury. I've always been very, very careful, uh, especially with my Osoto Gari, which happens to be my Takui Waza. I only do Osoto Gari at certain angles. And if I don't feel my angle is right, I simply let it go. Uh, Most of the people that I know that have been injured in Judo have actually been injured in Rondori and not necessarily Shi'ai. So I think the onus is on a lot of club owners, uh, sensei, coaches, to ensure that when there's practice, and, and that's even hard practice, that... You know, guys are doing the right things in order to not cause injuries with their teammates or other club mates. I, I, I think that's really critical. And I, I think the onus is on the instructors to ensure that for for 
99% of us, which we're all mostly we're recreational players, that we're not needless, needlessly suffering injuries in the club that can be avoided by just doing proper Rondori. The president of the IGF is going to be holding a Twitter Q&A on May 20th between 4 and 5 p.m. local time, which is local to Ekaterinburg in Russia. It might be a good time to ask him uh, whether or not the IJF is going to create some kind of prevention program against knee injuries. It's also a wonderful time to ask Marius Weiser what he thinks about the leg grabs and if leg grabs are coming back because, look, I know he loves that question. He he loves getting that question, and that question has probably been asked of him ever since he took the position as president of the IJF, and he told me, I, ha- I have it on good word, he wants you guys to ask that question. So you go for, go right ahead and ask him whether or not leg grabs are coming back in judo because I know he'll I know he'll respond to it. It's about time for my favorite segment of the Judo Chop Suey podcast. What time is it? Listener reaction. This segment of the Judo Chop Suey podcast is sponsored by one of my favorite YouTube channels, the Nick and Sai Show. Now. I'm not saying they're one of my favorite YouTube channels because they're sponsoring the segment. It's been one of my favorite channels for many, many years. Nick and Cy Collier have been creating judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, self-defense, and stunt-type videos for many, many years. And they also compete nationally in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Now, you guys have seen those John Wick movies, right? I, after all, it's a display of judo combined with guns and killing and all this awesome action stuff. Well, the Collier brothers are sponsored by 8711 Action Design, which is the company that produced and directed those John Wick movies. Go on and check out the Nick and Sai show on YouTube. It's www.theyoutube.com forward slash user forward slash Nick and Sai. I'll put the link in the uh, podcast description. Subscribe to them. And you know, while you're at it, subscribe to my YouTube channel too. I got a few messages from the listeners this week. You know, the typical kind of stuff where, you know, Dave, you've got a great podcast. You know, Dave, keep up the good work. Dave, you're so handsome. This, uh, I got a female listener that said, Dave, I want to <laughs> while <laughs> I'm like, all right, shame on you. You know, I'm married, but thank you. Anyway, I appreciate the thought. I did receive a pretty interesting email. I won't read the entire thing, but I'll, I'll read a portion of it. Uh, comes from a fellow by the name of Eric. And he says here, I teach a small group of guys at my judo club and I wanted to ask a question regarding curriculum specifically for adults. How long do you think I should have them spend time on a specific throw? For example, our lowest ranked member has seen Tayatoshi express interest in learning that technique specifically and it's going to need to be able to perform it for his next rank. As I'm sure you know, Tayatoshi is a powerful and versatile throw and to be honest, it may fit his judo style well. My other guys have a few ways that they use Tayatoshi, and though we can always work on perfecting techniques, we reach a point where we feel it's getting stale. I have discussed this with other instructors, and everyone seems to have a different opinion. I was thinking about having us focus on one technique per month as we meet twice a week for one and a half hour sessions between getting down the mechanics and learning it by the book for a few classes, letting them play around with different grips and entry combinations, and try to get to use it in Rondori. There would be a total of eight hours on one throw and its variations. I feel like spending a month... It's roughly in the ballpark. Do you think it's a good amount of time in general to spend on a single throw or is that too long? So that's a very good question and I have pretty, not a super strong opinion on that. So my first year in judo was spent pretty much learning all, at the time, all 67 throws of of Kodokan judo. That was the club I was going to was a very traditional club and I know in the first year there, I must have at least attempted every single throw in the judo syllabus once, at least once or twice, because we typically worked on three different throws in a particular class. It was, you know, we spend maybe five minutes trying it, but we would work on three, two or three particular throws in a class. Now, when I got to my next judo club where I spent the most amount of time with, with my with my, uh, the you know, the, my coach that I spent the longest amount of time with, we spent about maybe four to six weeks on a particular throw, three to four times a week. Uh, a lot of times I trained three to four times a week, and we would spend that time on one particular throw and learning its variations. I am more of a proponent of spending 
time on one throw for a long period of time because I really believe if you've got a forward throw and a rear throw, you you in competition, even the top guys, they really only have a repertoire of of three to four consistent throws that they're looking to do. And and the typical ones, you see Tayatoshi a lot, you see say, some form of Sayanagi, you see Uchimada, and you know, a lot of times you see a some kind of a foot sweep throw like like uh, Ouchigari or or you know Dayashi something along those lines. You see a lot of athletes; they tend to stick to the same throws that they find success with. And I personally think it's important to if you want to if you want your students to fast track to getting a good understanding of judo and the mechanics and, and really developing skills. I think instructors, I think it's better for instructors to focus on a, th- on a few throws that they know their students can do well and get and spend a lot of time on those throws, the nuances, the basics of it. If the throw is in a kata, learn it in a, in a teach it in a way that they would learn in a kata and then apply that to other competition type forms of that throw. Because a particular, while I personally believe all students should learn how to be able to do the throw in a demonstrative way, they may find a way to do that particular throw that works best for them. For example, there are some people out there that they, I think, you know, Taitoshi, for example, everybody out there should learn to do it in a demonstrative way. You know, that's that's two hands, you know, uh, sleeved, standard sleeve lapel grip and being able to do it from two hands there and not lose your shape of the, of the Taitoshi. But there are people out there who may not be able to do that very well, but really excel at the one-handed version of Taitoshi. So, I think it's important to spend four to six weeks on a particular throw and learn, you know, how to get into that throw, learn the combinations that set up that throw, learn how to get your certain grips to make that throw work for you. I'm not saying that spending time uh, learning all 67 throws within a year is a bad way to go about it, but I really do believe you you slow down the potential growth of students if you throw too much at them over the course of a year versus you know maybe over the course of uh, of a year at some other clubs you may only go over six or seven different types of throws but but you have students that learn those throws very intimately i i think with my judo coach the way that he taught me yeah i i don't have a good hanegoshi i don't i don't have a good Ukiyotoshi. But I have a decent Ouchigari. I have a really good Osotogari. I have a good Tayatoshi. And I have a good Sayanagi. And my Uchimata is still coming along. I, 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 that's the throw I've spent the longest amount of time with. Uh, and I still practice that throw to get better at it and to learn the nuances for it for my own particular body type. But I, I probably have about five or six throws that I do really well and and even some throws and I've managed to develop other throws because I learned the basics of those five or six throws that my coach taught me and we worked on repeatedly for for example I've I have a very good okuriyashi burai but I've never spent more than a class or two actually practicing it for what because some of the principles behind if you get really good at certain judo throws I think the principles behind the other throws will come a lot easier over time if you develop those those fundamentals with the other throws. So, and just to be clear on something, I know I just said that I I do five or six throws really well. Just just so you guys know, at the amount of time that I've been doing judo, I can demonstrate every single throw in the syllabus. But what I what I was saying was in terms of some sort of consistency. I, I definitely have a, a core, you know, five or six throws that I do with consistency that I can hit with consistency. And then I have some of the lesser throws that I don't hit with as much consistency. For example, a, a good example of that is like, like Ogoshi or, or Harai Goshi. Those throws I can hit, but I may not get to those throws as often as I can with, say, 
Osorogari or Ochigari. Those those ones I hit with a lot more consistency than those throws. But demonstrative in terms of demonstration, I can definitely demonstrate all the throws. At least I think I can. If there may there may be about three or four throws I can't properly demonstrate, but but I can at least demonstrate almost all the throws. So that's my opinion. And if you guys have a different opinion on that, feel free to let me know. Shoot me an email at uh, judochopsuishow at gmail.com or you can tweet at me at Levita Judoka. You, feel free to let me know what you guys think about that. All right, let's get to the interview. I'm sure most of you guys are sick and be talking. So I would like to turn it over to my guest. His name is Serge Boyso. He is the head coach and lead sensei at Mayo Quanchi Judo and Wrestling in Coventry, Rhode Island. He is also the coach director for USA Judo. Serge Boyso. Serge, thank you for joining the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. I'm a little bit exhausted, but, uh, you know, every day on this side of the grass is a good day. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I hear that. So, and I've, I've mentioned it to you before we started the interview. I'm a New England native. So, where are you from? Where is your club? And tell me a little bit about your club and your judo experience. Um, just yeah, just a little bit. And, and most importantly to me, because I've actually heard of your club before, can you explain mm-hmm. to me what the name Mayo Quan Chi means? I, I don't, I, I've never been able, in 11 years I've been doing judo, I've never quite understood what that name means. And, and I've been familiar with your club for almost that long. So go ahead and okay. tell me a little bit about yourself, please. So, so basically, uh, I was born in Coventry, Rhode Island, and that's where my judo club is. And the name of uh, my club is actually, uh, it's a philosophy, like no problem, no sweat. If you translated it, um, if you translated it, you know, to a literal meaning, but really it's like kuna matata, like everything's going to be all right. So from, um, from 14 to 16, I was a basically a troubled kid. I had decent parents, but I believe my dad had a PTSD, fought in some wars and made it really difficult for me to go home. So I was basically on my own from 14 to 16. And judo is definitely one of the things that, you know, kept me on the right track in my life. And uh, so, you know, I I became a very successful businessman. Uh, While I was on my own, I you know, did a lot of networking and I actually started my own business and I became very successful with it. And so, um, at one point I was kind of miserable. I was focusing on, you know, making money and not wanting to be the kid that's, you know, out sleeping outside anymore, uh, ever again. Right. So, so I kind of started taking in kids. Um, I've, taken in over 35 children to live with me that came from difficult situations, whether they were homeless or basically abandoned by their parents. And um, I've raised them like they're my own and I've used judo and wrestling as a tool to change their lives and give them discipline and give them self-respect. And so uh, that's where I got the name from Mayo Quanchi is that, uh, you know, a lot of these kids just need a chance. They just need something in their life that's positive as, as opposed to the cards they were dealt. And, you know, I I understand that we are a successful club, but uh, you know, the most important part of my club for me is the way we shape and mold lives of kids. You know, there's, there could be nothing better. You know, if you change the life of one child, you've, you've done a great thing. And, and judo is an excellent avenue for kids that um, have been struggling in one way or another, uh, including waywardness, including whether they're homeless or abandoned by their parents or looking for that family. You can fit all those needs in for these kids uh, with judo. And that, this is really incredible to me. I, I I didn't know this about you at all. How how were you able to develop that outreach in terms of like? I guess for lack of a better word, how do you quote unquote find these kids? Well, I, I am, I am a Christian, so I believe, you know, wholeheartedly that God put them in my lives. But so while I was a very successful businessman, um, uh, I was approached by the guy that was my counselor while I was, uh, you know, during that 14 to 16 years when I was having 
difficulties. And uh, he said to me, came to me one day, saw me in a restaurant right next to where my dojo is now and said, Hey, Serge, you know, you should come think about working for us over at Tides Family Services. You're one of our success stories and imagine the lives you could touch. And I thanked him at that time. And I said, you know, unfortunately, Brother Michael, I, I think I, um, I make more money per week than you could probably pay me per year. Um, so I walked away from that conversation and I was miserable every day uh, of my life. I, after that conversation and even before that I was I was very miserable and I I came to my wife one day and said you know I'm I'm thinking of taking that job at Tides Family Services but we'd have to take a drastic lifestyle change and my wife said you know when you when you met me you had nothing and she was a victim of child abuse and she had an adopted family and I went from you know living outside and being crazy and doing crazy things to, you know, very successful and having a wonderful family and very normal life. So I, I decided to take the leap of faith and I helped build uh, both financially and physically. I built a few schools for the homeless and the poor um, and all the kids that are rejected by society. And through that, through that um, family service agency that I was working for, I met a lot of the kids that I then, went on to take in and some kids I just met walking down the street. Like uh, um, th there's been a few that I, that I just see them doing one thing or another. And I say, Hey kid, what are you doing over here? How'd you like to come to judo? And when they tell me they can't afford it, I say, don't worry about that. I'll worry about that. What you worry about getting in the club and doing the best you can. That, that that's so, incredible. I, I I I you you may hear me very being very silent here. I'm I'm like hanging on every word that you're saying. I just I, I didn't know any of this at all. This is this is just really unbelievable stuff, Serge. I, I I'm I'm amazed and I'm, I'm touched in my own way. If you, somebody were to develop a program like this, what what would be your advice? Like how how would you advise somebody to even do something like this for their own local community because because this podcast is help uh, is is listened to in a lot of different places i mean what how would you suggest uh, somebody even attempt to get in that kind of direction maybe if they didn't even have the resources and such to do that well you know that's funny that you say that because a lot of um a lot of cities and towns have a governor's junior juvenile justice commission and there's a lot of federal grants that can go into helping with after school activities. So I would start with um, contacting our lo the local children's resources office and I would reach out to every school. I would reach out to the community centers. I would, you know, there's a lot of different things that you can do and apply for grants if you want to do it as a nonprofit, which I'm not, I'm not a nonprofit. So, Understood. At this point, I use the profits from my club to help subsidize kids that are not necessarily as well to do as some of the others or don't have the ability to do some of the things that other people in our club do. And, and you know, I, my whole club is basically brought into the concept of, you know, making the community a better place. And, you know, like I said, if you if you change one kid's life, just one. Uh, you, you will find that you will be much happier in the end. When you, when we take our last breath on this planet, I can tell you this. The day you know you're going to die, you're not going to be thinking of any medal that you have ever won, all the money in the world, whatever job position that you've had. None of those things are going to matter to you. If you, you want to make your life better right now, think about, you know, pretend as if you were, going to die tomorrow and what's important in your life. You're going to think about all those people that have been in your life and how you've affected them for the good or for the bad. And you can take certain things to the grave with you. I know that's what I'm trying to do at this point in my life is just, uh, just work on becoming the best person I can possibly be and helping other people to do that. And you, you know, that there couldn't be anything better for me. I mean, there's no amount of money you could give me to, uh, make me happy i after being a very successful businessman and giving it all up i literally liquidated my business and want nothing to do with that part of my life uh so 
You know, my suggestion to people is stop putting one foot in front of the other. Now, if you told me 25 years ago that I'd be where I'm at right now, I would say, you know, you're probably absolutely crazy. I would never give up my business to chase around a bunch of crazy kids. And, sure. you know, so there's different, just allow yourself to evolve with it. I mean, start one step at a time. The first step is start looking for a facility, get all your credentials that you need to become a certified coach, start advertising. It's usually I started my club with six kids and six kids that couldn't afford to pay anything. So then it moved on to where we were paying, I don't know, twenty five dollars a month or something like that. Just enough to pay the heat and electric. It it was it did not start out as the as the three hundred member club that it is today or two hundred and some odd members, whatever. It sure. Be. Uh it's it's really involved evolved from that time. Now how did you get started in judo? Uh I'm a runt. And my father was in the French military. He was in the he was a legionnaire. So coming from a French background, and I did do a lot of training in France. Although we were living here, uh, my father never became a U.S. citizen. Um, my mother was a citizen, and I was a citizen, and my sisters all were. But um, my parents decided at age three in, in 1974, I, August of 1974, I started at the Kent County YMCA with um, a gentleman by the name of Peter Contardo was running the club. And then, then I went on to train all over the world. And, you know, unfortunately, I was obsessed with um, never becoming that kid that was, you know, living in a tent or eating out of a trash can again in my life. So I, um, I never chose to go to try to make a national or Olympic teams or anything like that. Sure. So, um, I did travel all around the world and did as much judo as I can. And judo was always, uh, I understood that competition was not for me, but I never wanted that that um although i did compete i shouldn't say i didn't compete but world level competition was not for me because i couldn't i just couldn't afford it right so <clears throat> um i wanted to create something where other kids did not get stuck in the same trap that i got into and i wanted them to be able to follow their dreams and uh i started the mayo Quanchi judo club in a very humble start in the in the back of a lumber company that we owned on a wood floor. We didn't even really do any throws. We just started with fit-ins and did it mainly as self-defense. And then I took it a step further and bought, I think, a 2,000-square-foot building right in the heart of downtown Arctic, which is basically the armpit of Rhode Island. <laughs> and... No joke. We had drunks walking in off the street. It was, it was unbelievable. And then I, I only know Providence and Newport. Those are the two places I spent a lot of time in. So, <laughs> well, th those are pretty nice places. Yeah, exactly. So then um, we moved over to our our facility that we were at just before this in 2002. And I always had a solid business man. Being a businessman, I, I had a solid step by step that I would follow which I think that all judo clubs, if you're going to be a professional club, you should buy your own building instead of wasting money. Cause even when you can't get paid as much, if you can pay off the building, that's something that you have toward your retirement. Right. Um, so I bought the next building in 2002. And then two years ago, I literally um, moved into the most beautiful facility you could ever ask for in a judo club. I don't know if you've ever seen it. On I've, 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 I've been to your website. Those, those, uh, th that that facility is one of the best I've ever seen in, in a club. I've never been in any place that's anywhere near like that. So I'm very, well, it's just an incredible facility. Well, we have a um, we have a uh, a library. We have a tutor that comes in five days a week. Uh, that helps the kids when they get behind in school or helps the homeschool kids with whatever they have problems with. We have a full gym. We have a dorm room at the dojo. 
we have a couple of personal trainers that come in with and help the kids with uh, strength and conditioning. So we have an entire wraparound services. I don't think that there's, you know, any privately owned club that has all the services that we have uh, available to people. So, you know, I'm just trying to create something that is a model for people to see. And I, I honestly never, I sat around for years saying, I wonder when USA Judo is going to do, notice what we're doing here with the number of national champions we produce and right. international competitors. And then at some point I, um, I just said, well, eventually I have to realize that I've got to do this for myself. I can't wait for USA Judo. And I went ahead and I continued to create what I created today. That's, 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 uh, that's really amazing, sir. I mean, I, I, I can't, I can't possibly express to you how I, I can't even find the word. I don't think impressed is the right word. Just really, I, I think, you know, touched to, to hear you. Cause I've been in situations where I've had to, to, to help kids myself that were in really really desperate situations so but but to hear you doing this on on such a grand scale is, is so uh inspiring to me i i think that's the word i'm very touched and i'm very inspired by the story i again when i scheduled this interview i didn't know any of this and and it's unfortunate that this is the kind of story that I mean. I'm glad you're on here so that I could sh so that you can share this story because, it, like you were just saying, and this is I think it's a good segue in terms of you know USA Judo and getting noticed. This is this is this is a story that that needs to be shared. I mean this this I mean I, I'm I I don't know how else to put it. People need to know about this and and know that that this, that through judo that you can do a, 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 such a thing. And, and, you know, I'm you just... really don't have to, you don't have to go as crazy as what I've gone. You don't have to take 35 children in and raise them. Just the sport alone of judo, the, all the guiding principles of judo, you can change lives. And I think that you will, you will meet person after person after person that say, that tells you what judo did for their life. I mean, judo is an amazing thing in and of itself. You don't have to, you know, I tell people, you, a lot of people near me say, I, you know, I want to do what you've done and take kids into your home and into our home. And I say, yeah, you, you know, that's, it's not a fairy tale. It's not, it's not what you, you think it is. It's a, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot right. of heartbreak and it's a lot of, you know, it's a lot. Emotional investment. Uh, I, I, oh yeah. To say the least. And you're not always going to get what you think you're going to get out of it. So before you decide to take a child into your home, especially one that you don't really know or haven't known for a long time, you have to really understand. And I've been lucky. I've had a lot of good kids. And I've, I've had some failures, too. I've had, you know, kids rob me and steal my cars. And I've had kids yeah. you know, do silly stuff. And, you know, but that doesn't mean that I don't stop, that I stop trying because to right. me that's that's what it's all about those are exactly the kids i want to get my hands on as the ones that are the most damaged uh and now now it's very now it's very different now it's very different compared to what it was before i have a lot of kids living here that are actually olympic hopefuls so they're trying to develop from one point to the next and you know we have 30 or 40 women on the practice on the mat at every practice. I don't think there's any, any institution, any training center that has that many girls on the mat uh, in the country. I mean, they have some girls, right. but not the, but not that many. Also. That's right. I, I've, I, t I mean, truth be told, apart from maybe some Olympic training site or, or sorts, I've never, I've never heard of a judo club in the United States with the kind of numbers that you have. Um, and, and I just think that's uh, really brilliant. There are some out there like uh, Chuck Wall at Wall to Wall Martial Arts has a has a huge amount of people and I and I think that Jay Foster has a lot of people in his club. They have big numbers. Um, I don't know, you know, all the time how many national competitors and things like that, but they have big numbers and you know a lot of diversification in their programs. So there's a there's a few that I know of. Right, not, right. Not Interesting. Many. And those are programs I'm not familiar with. 
Yeah, and because I'm at the national tournaments all the time, and I'm actually very close with uh, Chuck Wall. We're 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 good friends, and he he owns uh, Judo Gear USA, Adidas. They're the official Adidas distributor for the United States. Him and his dad, Charlie Wall, and and we oh, work together. Okay. I, I I talk to them, and they help me out with certain things. And my club is uh, they 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 support a lot of the kids and support my club and help me with my vision a lot and. Uh, you know, Chuck's become one of my closer friends in judo. He's got a lot of great ideas. Uh, well, yeah, and I, I've heard of I've heard of that company. Um, the, the you know the the one that you mentioned that's the Judo Gear USA. Adidas. That's right. That's right. I am I am from I have heard of that for, for sure. Now, I'd like to transition into uh, a, a little bit on on the national scene. You, what is your current role in USA Judo, and and how did you end up in that role? My current position is that I'm on the board of directors, and I am the uh, I I fill the coach's chair. So, um, uh, the, I guess you want to call it the coaching director for USA Judo. Which that doesn't mean that I'm taking Pat. A lot of people get confused that. Uh, I am taking Pat Burris's spot. That's right. not the case. I'm simply the representative that the coach has elected to the board of directors for USA Judo. I recently, uh, just in January, I was, you know, officially put on the board. So I'm, I'm rather new to the board myself. And I think Doug Kawasaki, there's not a, there's a few newer people on the board. So there's been a, there's been a, a changeover of guard, so to speak. Yeah, and I, I was familiar. I know that I think that took place in in late December, if I'm not mistaken. I uh, um, I saw a, a story months ago on on the USA Judo's website uh, regarding uh, you know new people coming in and old people going out and, and such. Yeah, we so, officially got on the board in January. Gotcha. So, what are your roles and responsibilities for that particular position? Well. It's not like that particular position has a set of roles and responsibilities. The entire board is – so I, it, a lot of the things that we vote on and think about have, don't, are not just things related to coaches. So because you're the coach's representative does not mean that that's all you, that's all you deal with. So we basically assist and guide Keith, uh, the CEO – in steering the ship okay so the board votes on a lot of things that they agree with or don't agree with um plans philosophy we had we have to hold true to the um uh god my my brain is going going blank um our bylaws there is a set of bylaws with usa judo that says right. the way we should be operating as a business um so you know, there's a lot of things like that that we work on, and I've been working directly with Keith on on certain things and ideas that we have for development. Like last week, I flew to last Friday, I flew to San Antonio to sit down with uh, Eddie Liddy, Jim Herbeck, Jerry Navarro, uh, Brett Wolf, and we sat down and started creating a pipeline for athletes and and a, and a how to guide for coaches. You know, not just training centers, but the ability for all coaches to understand how to get their athletes from point A to point B, from a beginner to the international competitor like a Kayla or a Travis. Then there's a lot of things that we've been lacking at USA Judo, such as communication, where, um, you know, it's kind of put the organization in hot water. And I think that that you are going to see a, a huge change in the transparency of USA Judo now, and I'm I'm along with the rest of the board are pushing for that. Uh, we have some really good people on that board now that really do care. Um, I don't want to speak about whatever the other board was thinking about because I just I'm like whatever we did in the past, that's going to stay in the past. I don't want to be responsible for whatever happened in USA Judo up until this point. I want to be responsible for whatever is in my control from here going forward. And I think, and, and, I, to- and I, under- <clears throat> I understand that, Serge. And I'm glad you, 
you brought that point up. I, I, I in my last podcast, the one I released uh, last Monday, I, I pumped the brakes a little bit on some of the comments I made on the previous one, but I know you, you know after watching your Facebook chat, uh, Facebook live chat, and and hearing your comments here, I I think I, I would have to think that you could understand that some of the membership out there in USA Judo may be feeling. The same way that, that Kayla has, because, you know, Kayla said, you know, I'm breaking up with you in terms of USA Judo. And, and I, you know, my last podcast, I, I made the comparison. She almost sounded like a jilted lover. And, and I would think that there's many members in USA Judo out there who, who've lost that trust and, and, you know, kind of almost feels like they've been cheated on over the years of financially supporting USA Judo and, and some of those issues. Now, while I understand you want to move on and I, and I get that, I, I, I and I want you to understand one thing. I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. But I am, I am one of those people that were deeply frustrated. Right. So the, here's the thing. My thing is I sat there and I made a decision, a very conscious decision, saying I can be part of the problem or I can be part of the solution. I, I can't just sit back anymore and say, well, I give up. I'm not one of those people that give up. If, if that right. was the case that I was one of those people that give up, I would have been dead when I was between 14 and 16 years old when I would have to eat out of a trash can in my life. So I'm not one of those guys. And I always want to take a forward direction. I fully understand what they're going through because I went through it. I am one of those people. I am not um, – I i have received – next to no attention from USA Judo while I was doing a lot of great things. I fully understand the um, the good old boy network that a lot of people were talking about, that it was hard to get through. And I'm telling people right now, we have an opportunity for the most wonderful change USA Judo has seen in a long time. And matter of fact, I was on the phone night before last with uh, Anne Maria DeMars. Do you know who that is? Yes, of course. Okay, so I was on the phone with her telling her about how happy I was that we have the opportunity to make change. Most of the coaches on the national team know who I am. They know what I stand for. They know that I'm an upfront guy. You might not like, you might not always like, uh, Dave, what I have to say, but for sure is this. You're going to hear it. You're not going to have to listen to a third party tell you something. You're not, I'm not going to try to hide it from you. I will make decisions. And I will stick to the decision and say, hey, look, I made this decision because of X, Y, Z. And when people start seeing that, it's at a time where they need to realize that they need to make the positive jump and jump on board and help make the positive change. Continue with the mission of change this organization. If you are a molester or if you are a thief or if you are one of these people that are abusive physically or mentally – we're going to try to put you out of this sport. I mean, th there's been a lot of things that have been allowed in the past. And, I, you know, I'm not ignorant to that fact that there's a lot of things that have happened in the sport. Sure. But here's the thing. We have a new CEO. The majority of the board is new. And the guys that are still on the board, they're good guys. We want to make change. We want to move forward. And I'm not even casting any stones at the old board. I don't know. I, I don't know for sure any of the things that happened. All I know is I don't like the way we were operating and I'm getting involved and I'm going to make sure if you see me step down on that board, you better give up all hope because that's when I consider that the, uh, that, that the ship is, is done sailing. But we have a great CEO. Keith Bryant is one of the most honest and forthcoming altruistic people that I've met in a long time. And I don't, I'm a streetwise guy. Trust me when I tell you, it's pretty tough sure. to pull, pull the wool over my eyes. You don't spend, you know, years of your life, uh, you know, the way I did and not have a certain st sense of street, uh, wise to your, everything that you do. Mark Hill, the new president of USA Judo, amazing and brilliant man. And I mean, a brilliant man. Also very altruistic. I'm, I'm sure he's wondering why he even got on the board of directors because that man could do anything that he wants to do, but here he is helping judo. So I don't want to become a person that hinders them. I want to be right. become the person that helps them. And I want us all to jump on board. The people that have been disenfranchised in the past, 
just sitting there and complaining, that doesn't do anything. It, it really does nothing but hold up the wheels of, of progress. Now, how do you think um, how do you think USA Judo can start to mem- mend that relationship uh, with its membership? I, 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 so everything you're saying is is fantastic, but I have to believe that maybe people who are even more, I mean, far more directly impacted than than I certainly have been. I I, I would venture to guess. I would think that you would that USA Judo has to start mending that relationship and showing that. That this is an organization that that is uh, worthy of your trust and, and worthy of your support. So, how, in, the relationship goes both ways. So, you know, I Absolutely. I'm a current member. You know, and I'm a current member of USA Judo. And I, I and I said it on my podcast last week. I'm going to backtrack from some of the things I was saying. I was it was a little little nutty there, but <laughs> but. So how do well, you know that? something that 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 is that is what you are seeing and even what the, your reaction that's the build up over years of of being in a system that was not functioning properly. So I, you know when people when you have that type of backlash and even even Kayla uh, came back and apologized for the timing right. of her her event and I and I had a long conversation with Kayla. I love that girl. She is a fantastic person. She will be the first person to step up. And I've got some kids in my club that she stepped up and helped and mentored them. Uh, so you'll, you'll never hear a bad word come out of my mouth about Kayla. As a matter of fact, if someone has a bad word to say about Kayla, they are, they are going to be very subject to speculation in, in my book. So right. that being said, I was able to say to Kayla that, you know, that, that really wasn't the time for her to – say the things she said that people were there for different reasons. And we kind of took the limelight away from the Paralympians. And, you know, I gave Kayla my very honest opinion, but that doesn't change my opinion of Kayla. Okay. She's a wonderful girl and she's saying things from the heart that she truly means. Um, Not everybody's going to be able to understand all the decisions that are being made, but for the first time in a long time, we have taken the first step and the first step for mending all these things is transparency. Second step is yes. communicating and allowing all our people that come from the past that you can't imagine the number of people that I talk to in judo that at the end of their judo career, they feel as though they're disenfranchised with the organization. And to me, that is heartbreaking. Right. If, if I put out a, a, a memo on my Mayo Quan Chi site and say, hey, I need help. I raise more money than USA Judo can raise by doing that because we've Mm -hmm. disenfranchised our alumni and we've got to totally change that. Maybe the, whoever in the past felt, however we, they felt about moving people on. And, and I, and, and and to be clear, I don't believe it is our responsibility to make sure that you make a living after you're done doing judo. Right. But it is our responsibility to make you understand how much we appreciate you sacrificed for the sport we all love. Right. And a lot of people feel as though they're unappreciated when they've given everything they have to the sport, not just the Olympic medalists. Right. And I, I, I think that's why I was outraged over what happened, you know, with Kayla at that point. And, you know, and, and again, you know, I don't want to go back and keep going back to that. I just I just wanted to point that out for myself and for a lot of people out there who are outraged because we I I mean, I don't know intimately the kind of sacrifices these athletes make. But I certainly uh, I certainly have heard the stories. It's a tremendous sacrifice, even for I mean, you said it on your own uh, Facebook live feed that you have invested nearly a million dollars, if not more, in your own daughter's um uh, goal to get it get to the Olympics, which you know, again, congratulations to her. She 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 had a nice finish at the Pan Ams, um, but I I gotta believe that you've experienced those kind of issues as well I, I, on a more personal level with with your own daughter. I would think. Oh, my son and my daughter Everett Deslitz is my son, and he and 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 the frustrations for me with the lack of communication and the lack of understanding. Everything I know about all this stuff is stuff I had to figure out on my own. And I just think there's a quicker way and I think there's a better way for us to operate and communication is the key. And, you know, Keith Bryant is right on board with that. So is Mark Hill. Transparency, step one. Communication, step two. Empowering all our clubs, step three. Allowing people to understand that we truly care about them and our sport 
you know, there's a lot of things that are going to go into the recipe and we are making positive progress. We are in the black. I don't know the last time. Great. I, yeah, I don't know the last time that we've been in the black. We are going to quarterly be posting the financials for people to take a look at so they understand where we're at. I mean, to me, those are huge first steps for people to be able to look at and say, oh, my goodness, they're not hiding anything. Oh, my goodness, they're communicating. Oh, my goodness, they may actually give a shit about us, in which we do. We need them. And one of the things I said is that we need to treat these people like they are our family and like they are our customers and like they are our alumni. And then you will see that people want to give back to the organization of something that was so great for them. I cannot tell you the amount of money that I've put into judo. You'd probably throw up. Yeah. But, <laughs> right. I do so willingly because I know what judo personally did for me. I know what judo helped me with, not just as an exercise, not just as something to do, but how it shaped me and molded my life. It is. Now you've talked about, um, you've talked about wanting to, in, you, in your chat anyway, wanting to at some point have some kind of a an alumni system and a, a support system for the athletes once they're done competing. Can you give me just just at a high level what your your thoughts are in regards to that? Well, here's the thing, right? And I'm going to use my own club for an, for an example. If a young kid needs a job. In five seconds, he's got a job. He doesn't have to be doing judo. And some of my kids get um, get uh, sponsorships from the alumni of my club, people that have gone through and right. own their own businesses or people that have been thankful that own their own businesses and judo did a great thing and Mayo Quan Chi did a great thing for their club. Why can't we have something like that with USA Judo? Because we've disenfranchised our our group and and i think if we change the culture a little bit to make people know and understand and just a little bit of love and support how thankful people will be and they'll be quicker to write a check to help support these kids and we'll be able to get jobs for them hey uh kayla harrison needs a job where could she get a job you'll see that people will pop up and i don't want it to just be for the kayla harrison's okay Uh, kayla can obviously get a job anywhere she wants and probably travis can too but how about the guy that didn't quite make it, that wasn't quite good enough, that gave five, six, seven years of his life putting it into judo? How about that? How about right. we think about some more scholarship opportunities for kids when they're done with college? I mean, we're done with judo to, you know, have scholarship opportunities. And would people be willing to give to that? I bet I can guarantee you there'd be a lot of people willing to give into a scholarship opportunity for a retired athlete. How do you Two-year think- programs, four-year programs. Right, right. Now, how do you think – so you just brought up some of the athletes that, that don't make it. I, I – you know, in your Facebook Live chat, again, I, I think you put it in a in a really, really good context I had not considered before. The the logistics of bringing up the level of, of – uh, uh, the skill level from from the ground up is very difficult because this this country is, is, is huge, you know, going across. I mean, this just in Florida alone, you could fit like – you know Switzerland and in and the Netherlands all in in Luxembourg all in in Florida just alone and those countries you know have shown some success how how do you envision getting the skill level up um for some of the other athletes because because I think I think there's a common theme with some of the athletes that have found you know gotten on the medal stands for for the Olympics uh in terms of of uh, you know either world championships or, or the Olympics that uh, Jimmy Pedro's had a big part of that. How how do we bring up the level so that we can you, not just the grassroots level, but even going up all through the different stages, bring up the level of coaching and how, how do you envision that happening a, a, across the United States? And, and you don't have to get into specifics, but maybe kind of at a high level, what your thoughts are on that? Well, one of the things I want to do is I want to create a how to in USA Judo. Uh, a how to start a club, how to grow a club, how to manage a club, how to awesome. guide your athlete from beginning to end. And one of the things that I met with, with Eddie and uh, Jim Herbeck and uh, uh, Jerry Navarro and Brett Wolf uh, is we need to create a pipeline. And I keep using the word pipeline 
so that people understand, okay, my kid has hit, has reached, he's, he's winning at the local level. He's won in the last six tournaments. What's my next step? Okay, if you've won in these local tournaments, your next step should be junior national championships. Depending on how well you're doing at, the, at your level, you go to junior national championships. If you're winning at the junior national championships, you should consider these camps, these development camps, A, B, C, D, whatever they are. Then next step from there, uh, you're going to try uh, a continental open when you get to the age appropriate level. Um, you'll try a continental open and then you will attend these training camps. When you start to begin to have success from there and just, just spell it out. Right. One, two, three, a step-by-step -step process. So a coach who does not necessarily have all the best abilities in the world, because let's face it, not every kid can pack up at 17 or 18 years old and move to a training center. Not every right. kid can do that. Just because right. you're proficient in your sport does not mean that you're proficient in life. And a lot of kids, I don't know about what you knew at 20 years old, which I was, I owned my own house at 20 years old, but right. Uh, most of the kids that I know of at 20 years old and even myself at that age, although I was successful in some areas, was still very immature as to what life immature. was all about. Yeah. yeah I agree. You know, there's a certain amount of wisdom you lack. So, you know, when you send them off to a training center, they're not necessarily going to be that kid's parent. So the, the kid that needs that little extra help has to stay home near his parents. And if there's not a training center near there, we should still be able to enable that kid to get to the level of, that he needs to. If he right. needs to stay home and go to college because he can't handle going away to college and he has to start at a junior college, we have to consider that person and all those people because there are a lot more like that than there are that have all this shit together and are able to go to a training center. Uh, so, you know, uh, I want to create a process in a very clear detail that helps the coaches say, okay, I've got my kids to here. This is the next step we need to take. And I, and I make myself available for any coach in the country that wants, I share my cell phone all the time. And I got to tell you that I am on the phone a lot and I, I've given my whole life over to the sport of judo and I, I will gladly help anybody anytime that they want. And, and of course, you know, we have some coaches that think they, they know everything and they really don't. Right. And what you're saying here about a, a pipeline is great because I was just saying this on my own podcast that I, I know that, you know, if I had somebody who, and I, and, and I do, I got, I got, I got a couple of kids that have, have some legitimate skill. I know personally, I am not the guy to be able to get them to that next level, but I don't know what I would need to do to get them to that next level. I, I just, I just don't know. I mean, I can teach what I know and, and I'm, con I'm constantly learning through, through reading. I know superstar judo has a, has a nice thing that I, I do utilize to get better myself. But, but apart from that, I wouldn't know what those next steps are. So I, I'm telling you that, that kind of a pipeline and a, and a guide for, for people, you know, lower level, you know, grassroots people like myself would, would be, would be tremendous. Now, I do have a question. Um, this this question may seem a little bit unusual, but I'm sure it's been in the minds of many people at one point, whether they're uh, not only just just assistant coaches or or even just students. Why should people join USA Judo? And and I ask this question because a lot of times when I was coming up through the ranks and, and such, I was told I need to do, join USA Judo because. I need it for promotions. I need it for insurance. I need it to enter tournaments. But if when I ex those reasons are all selfish reasons, so to say. So you were touching on this on your Facebook Live uh, last week. You were approaching this from a different angle. I wanted to expound on that. Why should we join USA Judo? What's what's the big picture in, involved there? Uh, do you love Travis Stevens and Kayla Harrison? Of course. Are they on your team? Yes. That's Team USA Judo, my friend. At the end of the day, we're all on the same team. And there comes at some point that we decide that we join USA Judo because we want to give to an organization that's supporting those people that we love that are on our team. I think USJA and USJF are wonderful organizations, and they fit for the people that they fit for. 
But for all of us, I don't think there's anybody that shouldn't be, become a member of USA Judo because that supports the people that have the Olympic dreams and the Olympic development athletes. And that's really, we all feel like they are on our team. We turn on that TV and believe it or not, every contribution you make counts. We wouldn't have half the problems that we've had uh, financial. Well, maybe we would, but going forward, we will, we, we will get rid of a lot of our financial problems. If we all understand that we're part of that team, you are part of team USA and USA judo is like it or not the governing body of judo for the United States. JA and JF are group a members of uh, USA judo and they are the parents of USA judo. USA judo is the child of those two organizations. We all have a part of it. We all have our place in it. And we should all support it. If you truly, if you truly feel like you're part of that team and you have that Kayler and, you know, in my club, right? Every single person in my club shares in Caitlin's and Everett's success and our other kids that are like NCAA placers in wrestling. They all share in that success. They're all, that, that success. They're all part of that team. We should all be part of that team that gives back to the and, – and, and not necessarily what it can give to us. It's what we are going to do to be part of our team. You know, and I love, I love that back? you're making there too because I, I think I, – I, I would venture to guess. I know for myself at that time when I heard you say that before and for a lot of other people, you're almost kind of turning it upside down in, in what our role with USA Judo should be. And I, I think – I think to show to to explain that you you share in their success, I I think it's such a great way to put it. Well, thank you because it's true. I mean, at the end of the day, we all are on the same team. And I, like I go to practice at times with people from other clubs, and our our team will get together, and we have two training camps a year, and people from all around the country come and and train, and then we will go and. You know, we're going to Florida in June. We're going to go train with other clubs in Florida, and we're going to share that. And some of the clubs that we're going to share and train with are people that we are usually fighting against in the finals. But you know right. something? No matter who wins that contest, at the end of the day, we are all on the same team, Team USA. We need to all work together. It's as simple as that. And that's, you know, we've got to find ways to overcome our geographic problem in the United States are, um, you know, you think about it, if we have 15,000, which USA Judo has 10,000 some odd members, which I think it should be a lot more than that. And if we, we continue going the way we go and uh, we start bringing back all the distant franchise and people understand that, uh, you know, we should all be part of it. Uh, you'll see that number double. And I would love to see us get to a hundred thousand or 500,000. It'd be, it'd be wonderful. It would solve a lot of problems. If we showed people how to get clubs off the ground, frankly, I don't think you should have to be a black belt to start a judo club. I really don't. Uh, I want to I want to jump on that before before I forget. Currently, right now, and, and I think th this is one of the questions that I've actually received from some of the listeners. I, I've received several variations of this question. How do we improve, or how can USA Judo improve the access to classes for? coaching and refereeing because for myself and for many other people look, many people have to travel pretty far and and my next opportunity to go to 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 get a coaching certification will be in July for the US Open but I, that's that's a almost a 300 mile drive in in one direction and I'm I'm willing to do it but but I I got to believe there's got to be a better way than than these these one offs every once once in a while so how can we improve in in, in that regard well, I, I can tell you that I think at some point we need to go to an online uh, coaches certification uh, process. Uh, so you go for your first one with a live person, and then after you can re up through online stuff. That's that's just my opinion. I can tell you that how I base this. Okay, wrestling has what two hundred and fifty, two hundred and seventy five thousand members in the United States. I think I just mm -hmm. saw it the other day. So even if they have more than that or a little bit less than that doesn't matter you have you ever wrestled no i've not wrestled not in high school no okay so within within maybe four hours or so you can open your own wrestling club 
He never huh. wrestled in your life. Interesting. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. In judo, in judo, you spend five, six, seven years of training and learning, but you still a lot of times people still can't open clubs. I don't care what your skill level is as an instructor. As long as you're not molesting kids and you have an idea of the safeties of things, of how to teach kids how to fall and a few basic throws and pins, I think you should be able to open a judo club. I don't see why not. As long as you can pass uh, a I'll background check. We will, you'll see judo grow like you wouldn't believe. We Agreed. try to, in, in, this, in this country, right, we make it almost impossible to get a black belt, but then you can get all these other kind of higher crazy ranks for no apparent reason. There are people walking around with red and white belts that I scratch my head saying, <laughs> well, how did that I, happen? I, yeah, 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 I, I do. <laughs> I, I know I know what you're saying. Um, I was doing a, I was doing a clinic a couple of years ago. Someone paid me to come and do a clinic, and there was another person there aside from myself wearing a red and white belt. And I was doing some transitional mat work. Okay, we were transitioning from Juji Katami to Osai, to uh, a different pin. Okay, I said, uh, so what do you think of that transition process? Do you um, do you have a little something you might want to add to that? He looked at me and said, oh, no, listen, I don't do mat work. I don't have any idea how, what, what. I'm looking down, and this guy's an eighth-degree black belt. I said, you've got to be kidding me. You don't do mat work. <laughs> I never yeah, heard of that's, I mean, that. That's insanity. Where did, yeah. who, where did you get that belt? You know, so <laughs> not, I, it doesn't mean that, you know, I'm knocking every red and white, red and white belt in the country. Because we have, we have plenty of people that do deserve it. I, I I know what you're saying. Uh, believe me, I I do get what you're saying, and I I I understand that. But and and I also agree with your point. I know a lot of I know some of the listeners out there they don't agree with me on this. That it, it needs to be easier for for people to teach judo. There it, there seems to be so much. Re- I know for myself, I'm just I'm just a lowly shodan, just your your local ham and egger. But I know if I wanted to open up my judo club. Uh, there would be a lot of red tape that I'd have to walk around and maneuver around to even get that. And and even then, I'm not even sure if I would be allowed to do it. I, I want to get rid of all that stuff. Yes, you're a showdown. You could open a club. Uh, but I want to get rid of all that stuff. And I think that, that people should be pushing their, their athletes when they're done to be opening clubs. I know this. My daughter, uh, my, my adopted daughter, uh, Sandra Chevalier, just opened up a judo club in Rhode Island and I'm so proud of her and my other six children. I'm hoping that eventually they will open up judo clubs too. Uh, does it hurt me? Not at all. There's nothing wrong with competition. And I think that a lot of the old senseis prefer to keep everybody instead of push them out the door and say, okay, it's time for you to go spread your wings, go open up a club. And it, it, it I just think that we have to make it an easier pro process to open a judo club now, i'm not saying that, that you don't have people go through background checks and all this other stuff but uh th- there has to be uh a safety evaluation it doesn't mean that you get to go coach olympic teams or national teams or world teams uh it, it means that you can start opening up a club and introducing judo to people and a lot of and times you'll see community. right that's right a lot of times you'll see those people say okay i've taught you everything I can teach you. It's time for you to move on. I have clubs in this area that send their kids to me after they feel as though they've taught them everything they can teach them. They tell right. them, okay, your next step is you, you've got to go see Serge because I, I frankly don't know what to do with you at this point. So, you know, you, you have that and you, you, you've got to be able to create that. We need our judo infrastructure to look like a pyramid. But here's the thing, right? Um, we need to like a lot of people have no idea how to open a judo club. We should have a very clear understanding of how to start a judo club, how to manage a judo club, how to, and make it an, as easy and painless as a pro of a process as possible. USA judo wants to grow its numbers, but it seems to be very difficult for people to do that. They take a look at everything that's involved and they're like, hell, I can't, I don't know what the hell I'm doing there. 
we need to empower people to be able to do that. And I'm hoping that we can, in the next two years, get that off the ground. So we create a pipeline so people understand what I need to do and the direction these kids need to go in and start creating camps and opportunities to help save parents money instead of running around the country spending thousands and thousands of dollars fighting the same six kids in a different state each each time. Right. And, and understanding, like I, me and Bert Mackey have worked on getting a camp after Junior Olympics for the last year. So hopefully, hopefully uh, we get a lot of people to do that. I have a judo tournament that I run. It's on May 20th. And people come to the tournament. It's a point tournament. But also you can get as many fights in the exhibition divisions as you want that day. Oh, okay. The exhibition divisions are free. Right. Also, the next day we run a camp after it. So instead of just coming and – so you, I see these people. They spend you know, $6,000 for their child to go to Pan Am championships. They go to infantile Pan Ams. The matches are two minutes long. There's no camp after. Right. The average person gets two to three fights. That means, well, let's double it. Okay? So say you get six fights. I've never seen it happen. Say you get six fights. That means you're on the mat for 12 minutes. You spent $6,000. Well, let me just cut it in half, which... It's always more than this. Right. You spent $3,000 for 12 minutes on a mat, and somehow we're wondering how, we, how we're failing to develop athletes. Let me think about that. I can go to France twice or three times for that amount of money, get a <laughs> judo camp and a four-day camp, get a judo tournament that has 100 kids in the division, and a four-day yeah. camp after that for half the money. Yeah. You think about that hours that you spent dollar per per minute on the mat. And you have to understand, we have to start creating those opportunities and for people to understand that. I, like I said to somebody, they said to me, oh, oh, you have all these kids that are number one on the list. Because uh, I have a lot of them that are number one in the rankings. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go to Pan Ams? I look at them and say, absolutely not. Well, why aren't you going to Pan Ams? Well, I'm not going to Pan Ams because it's a waste of money. Right. It's a right. waste of time. I'm not going to try to do that until my kids are cadets and older and they're in actual divisions. I did that at the beginning because I didn't know any better. It didn't, it didn't take me too many times to figure out like, oh, wait a minute. This was a waste of time. My, kid's not, my kid just won Pan Ams, but they're no better for what they just did. And, you know, it's, it's very important that we understand dollars – Especially with the with the with the um with with the obstacles that we have to getting better, having fifteen thousand members spread out three thousand miles apart, that we have to maximize dollar for training experiences. If that makes sense to you, yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Now to follow up on some of these points, this is one of the questions, or I've I've received a couple iterations of of this question. What is USA Judo's actual role? at the grassroots level. And and I asked this question because, you know, I, I received a question where are we headed for the future? What's the plan? I, I think there's a sense from some of the members of USA Judo, some of the club owners out there at a more grassroots local level that there need that USA Judo needs to do more. So but but maybe maybe some people are not understanding what that role actually is from USA Judo to the grassroots. Can you address some of that a little bit? Well, you know, USA Judo is um, USA Judo is the governing body. I already covered that, right? So right. Yes. Yes. They have a certain amount of responsibility toward developing these young athletes, getting them into that pipeline, and showing them how to succeed, so that they are ready to win on the senior international level hasn't really existed and what i was trying to create the other day with eddie is a system that says okay uh you've won and I, there's a tournament that i want to create also uh and we start identifying kids at young ages that say this is your this is our kids that we need to look at developing toward the future 
So when you, when you see the kids that they're in the top of the rankings, you say to yourself, let's start tracking these kids, tracking their success over a period of time. So we kind of have an idea of who's going to be coming up and how we can help them. If you go into, if you go into wrestling, you go to a wrestling tournament, how many college scouts are sitting there looking at these high school events? There's a pipeline for success. And those college scouts walk up to them and say, hey, you know, we'd like to. And I want to create something like that with USA Judo. Hey. And it's funny you say it's funny you say that because I I actually so I received a, a question about this from somebody you know uh, Christopher Round uh, he had asked what are your plans surrounding the development of scouting skills for coaches in the United States I'm, I missed what you just said how what what, what okay how so the, so uh, okay so so uh, what are the plans surrounding the development of scouting skills for coaches in the United States, a, a fellow that you know, Christopher Round, had sent that to me as a question to ask you. Oh, yeah, I know, Chris. So yeah. um, we have to have a very clear method of who we're choosing. So we now have a point roster, which we, which years ago we didn't have a point lo- roster for anybody under a certain age. We have a point roster now for under – even down into the Bantams. So we have to be very clear that – the people we're choosing. So we're not showing favoritism and it has to be very, you know, transparent as to why we're giving who, what money. So the children, the top kids in each category on the point roster are kids that we're going to be starting to, and and it doesn't have to be, like I said to Eddie, it doesn't, because we are, we're, we're not, we don't have huge numbers. We're going to pick like the top five males and the top five females in each of the like junior IJF divisions, cadet uh, divisions, intermediate, or say under 15 divisions, so that we start saying, okay, these fab five, these these five kids, these five males and these five females, they're on the top of that roster. We need to start creating opportunities and communication with those people that are on the top of that roster so that we can up their value and 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 explain to them what their what their opportunities actually are and not just financially just guidance because there's a lot of kids that you know i don't know what travis won as a young kid but there's a lot of kids that you'll see come up that they didn't win anything as a junior but when they became seniors they they started winning so it can't it can't just be um a hundred percent the rule that these are the people that we're choosing, you know, obviously that not everybody that's winning as a junior is going to win as a senior. But I would say that there's a huge percentage of those kids that if you're winning all the way up through juniors, there's a very good chance that you're going to be winning in seniors also. So it, instead of just, you know, basing our ideas off opinion, because then, then everybody's going to say, well, well, my kid should deserve all the attention. Exactly. So when we start letting opinion get involved, that's that's when we're asking for trouble, and and it could show like we're looking, like we're showing favoritism. And I, you know, I'm not interested in anything like that. I want to I want a clear cut idea of who we're thinking about. And and the junior point rosters are are definitely a, a way to do that. Right. Right. Yeah. That that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I actually have a another question from Chris. He asks, uh, uh, he says, "Does he see value in judoka continuing to cross train in wrestling?" Now, you have your j- judo club is a judo and wrestling club. Do you have your own students cross train in wrestling? And and what do you think about uh, judoka cross training in wrestling? I think cross training is a fantastic opportunity for kids to get as much mat time as possible. We lack ability to be able to get kids to tournaments all the time in judo and wrestling gives them the physicality. It might not give them the throwing and it might not give them the mat work that they need, but it will certainly help them with their strength and their physicality and their endurance. I encourage people to cross crane with both uh, wrestling and jiu-jitsu. I, I see nothing wrong with cross training. You know, there's a, there's some coaches that don't like their kids lifting weights. And I think that if you're going to be a serious judo player or a serious wrestler, you need to be lifting weights and you need to get yourself as physically prepared as possible to, 
uh, excel in, 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 in the events that you want to excel in. Now, what, what do you think of, um, have you had much experience uh, with, with Brazilian jiu-jitsu at all? I'm curious what your, your thoughts are on judoka, at higher level judoka, people like your daughter, cross-training Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'm sure that, you know, that's a question that I've also received. What, from, from elite, the truly elite athletes in this country, what are your thoughts on them spending any time in jiu-jitsu during their competitive careers? I think if you sit and take a look at some of the athletes that were successful, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to cross train with jujitsu. What it means is as a coach, you need to understand that they need to spend an equal amount of time on mat work as they do in Tashiwaza. And if the coach is not doing that, then you need to supplement with jujitsu, go to a jujitsu class, get out there as much as you possibly can and put your hands on as many people as you possibly can. I think it's fantastic for people to spend some time doing actual Brazilian jiu-jitsu or any jiu-jitsu. It doesn't have to be BJJ. Any jiu-jitsu where we're working, where the concentration is mainly on mat work. Now, I have a – go ahead, sir. Please, go ahead. I think the benefits of that um, greatly increase increase your chances when when you can't – if you're weak in a certain division, you're going to bump into the person in a division that is going to be able to exploit that weakness. I mean, look at some of the wins that Travis had at the Olympics. He dragged that guy to the ground, the Georgian guy that had beaten him several times, yeah. dragged him to the ground and, and did his business on him. That, that, that was mat work. And you've got to excel in all areas of judo now. You can't just have a good stand-up game. There used to be a time then you'd sit on the ground like a clamp five seconds and the referee would say mate but now they're allowing not anymore on no that's right you need to have a diversified game if you're going into uh judo matches today more than ever i mean when you got into the ground with jimmy pedro years ago you knew you were in trouble anybody that got on the floor with him did they call it jujitsu no they didn't he just had superb mat work and uh you know you don't want to be down there with jimmy if you don't know what you're doing he's going to tear off your arm right right absolutely absolutely now, I have uh, one last question for you. It's another another listener question here. Um, he asks, why can't USA Judo accept members uh, membership affiliations at their tournament from other uh, associations like the USJA or USJF or AAU? He says, my students pay for their membership to compete in the tournaments plus registration fees. They will use that membership maybe once a year. We're running off a lot of parents and students with all the fees. W- w- what do you think about that, Serge? Well, I, I'm not sure if it still exists, but I believe that you can buy joint membership for $30 a year. So if you're a member of JA, you can also be a member of USA Judo for a little, a small amount of money. I, I believe that that's still available. I, I might be wrong about that, but uh, the bottom line is if you want to be in a USA Judo tournament, it's a USA Judo tournament. Why would you not be a member of the, the organization that's putting it on? It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. So then why would anybody become a member of USA Judo if they could just go right around them? Yeah, yeah so that, that's fair. It, it wouldn't make business sense for an organization like USA Judo to say, hey, uh, we're just going to let everybody come to our tournaments if they're, if they're a member of another organization. And I believe that you can go to uh, – other tournaments just provided it's not a national championships or a continental championship or an international tournament. Aside from that, you can, if, if I pull a, if I pull, like I have my tournament, the ocean state international, um, on May 20th, which is not just another week away. If you're a USJA member, we accept you to our tournament. You can, you can be, you can, become you can enter our tournament and you don't have to pay a usa judo fee that's part of the joint agreement the only thing is you you can't be on the usa judo point roster without being a member of usa judo yeah what it's it's not it's not um it's it's not that they don't want to allow people to compete they certainly do and they also created i i believe i would have to go back and look but i don't i don't ask for discounts when i um when i join other memberships i'm a member of um 
JF and uh, USA Judo. And I was on the development committee for JF too. Um, oh, okay. They had asked me last year to come on board and I agreed with that. Uh, unfortunately, I've been super busy, so I haven't been able to get involved as much as I'd like to. Um, but, you know, it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense for USA Judo to try to track people that are members of other organizations. I mean, if, if you are thinking that you want to go to an international level and you, um, and that's something that you want, then, then you need to be a member of USA Judo. It makes sense. It makes sense to me again. Just, just asking the question, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. And, and I understand that because, you know, years ago I was a USJA club. I was not a USJA. I was not a USA Judo member. And at, at one point I sat and said to myself, well, listen, this is what I want to do. I want to prepare kids for international competition. I need to be a USA Judo club. If you're not interested in international competition or national level competition, where your children are receiving points and, uh, then it wouldn't be a big deal. You don't, then you can belong to a grassroots growing judo organization. But the minute that you want to go to national competition, which is USA judo and receive points on a USA roster and allow yourself to try to make international teams, that there's a really only one alternative and that's to become a USA judo member. And that's, that's, that's their job. Otherwise you're asking a grassroots organization to start doing international level stuff. And that's not what their role is supposed to be. Of course. Well, Serge, I really, really, really appreciate your time here. I have thoroughly enjoyed you being on the podcast. I, I know you're a very busy man and I don't want to keep up too much of your time, but I'm, I'm very grateful for the time you've given me. We've got uh, at least an hour here. So just really, really fantastic stuff. And I, I want to wish you the best of luck with your tournament next week and, and just continued success with your club. And, and, and really, again, just, just so impressed with what you're doing with, with the kids who are troubled youth and such. Just, uh, just, just keep on keeping on with that, man. That's just, just awesome, awesome stuff. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate your comments. And you can call any time. I'm glad to sit and chat. And if anybody has any questions, my personal cell phone number is 401-626-0055, and I will communicate with people. I am a communicator, and I will be as open and honest as I possibly can be. Uh, I, and if I don't have an answer for you, uh, or anybody for that matter in judo, I will go out and find the answer for you. I don't pretend to know everything, but I will 100% go find answers for you. Awesome stuff. Serge, thank you so much. You have a great rest of the day. And again, good luck with your tournament next week. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. What do you guys think? I absolutely love doing this interview. I think Serge is a tremendous human being. And I think Judo needs more people like him. And I, I was just blown away by, by his story by what he's doing at his club and 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 being willing to be out there for the membership I think is tremendous. Now guys, he gave out his number. Don't abuse it. None of these silly calls, you know, prank calls. I know don't even don't even I know some of you freaks out there want to want to be like, "Hey, you know, call him up and be like, Hey, do you got a John in the house? And he'd be like, no. And then, what, what are you being a Dixie Cup? That kind of thing. Like, come on, don't do that. That was like funny when you were 12, but uh, maybe some of you are 12. I, I got no idea. I know I got to say that, you know, it used to be a lot more fun to do prank calls in the 80s for sure, because there was no such thing as, as caller ID. There was no such thing as star six seven or whatever that is to, to call people back as a star six nine. I don't know what it is or star seven one. You used to have none of that back in like 87. So you could get away with prank calls and, and, and get a good laugh with your friends. I remember when I was a kid, I used to take back in the infancy of cable TV days, I used to take my cable remote and sneak up to people's houses and turn off their cable box as they were watching TV. And I remember I did this repeatedly to a, to a particular guy and he got so fed up. He ended up 
going to his garage and getting his toolbox trying to fix the cable box. Never never knowing to this day that it was me shutting off his cable TV. So can't do that anymore. It's just it's not quite the same. But anyway, I digress. Please don't prank call Surge. Don't do any of that crap. He, he you know, somebody puts himself out there, you know, and I I'm willing to bet he would actually pick up your phone call and 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 answer your questions if you have a concern or or a question regarding anything. I mean, the guy is just just an incredible credible human being and and again, I I feel fortunate to have been able to interview such a person and I think we all should feel fortunate that he is on the board of directors for USA Judo and I I got to believe that things are looking up for USA Judo if there are people like him I've been told by more than one person that that the president of USA Judo um Mark Hill is another good guy and and you know sir just said it uh, I, I've received personal, you know, I'll just keep their names anonymous, but I've received other messages saying, yeah, some of these guys are really good. So, all right, well, let's see. I mean, USA Judo, again, I, I said in the beginning of the podcast, they put out their a, an expense sheet and they're showing a, they're showing a, a, a profit. They're showing that they're in the black. And, and these are the type of things that I think USA Judo needs to continue to demonstrate to, to mend that relationship between the members and the board of directors and the leadership at USA Judo. And I fully expect that in two years that this organization is going to look completely different than it has in years past. So again, Serge, if you're listening, thank you so much for joining the podcast. I greatly appreciate it. And with that, I think I'm going to end things here. I appreciate you all checking out the podcast. If you want to reach out to me, you could tweet to me at La Vida Judoka. You can follow me on Instagram, also at La Vida Judoka. You can email the show at judochopsuishow at gmail.com. And, of course, you can harass me on Facebook if you want. Just search for Judo Chop Suey, and you will find me out there. So with that, I hope you have a great day. I hope you have a great rest of the week. Train hard. Stay safe out there. And until next time, I'm out. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Op, 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 op. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Op, 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 op. Open Gangnam Style. Hello? Hello? I can ask you for a number. Do you have the phone number already? No, I want to ask you for the number right. for my friend. All right, Director Assistance will be able to help you. One moment. I've got... Who is this? What was thing? I'm looking for the number for my friend. Sure, what would be the last name? The, the, his name is Hamad Gebrecher. Do you help me spell the last name? Um, okay, you want to start? I should start. Sure. Oh, I should start. B R E C H E R Brecher. B R E. I'm sorry. What was the other letter? C H E R. X X E R. No, C H for Brecher. It's the same letter two times. Oh, B R E K K E R. No, C H E R. B R E C H E R for Brecher. Is it B R E A K K E R? B R E A. That's his Brecher, no. They have a B-R-E-A-K-E-R. Would that be possible? B-R-E-A-K-E-R. No, Brecher. Hamotre Brecher. What would be the first name? You don't know Hamotre? I'm sorry? Hamotre, you know? No, I'm connected to my supervisor on moment. The supervisor? Supervisor Morris, thank you for waiting. How may I help you? This is Morris? This is Mark. Mark? Yes. Oi, it's a broch. Because I thought that they was going to connect me to Hamad Gebrecher. No, sir. It's uh. the supervisor. I, I supervisor? Yes. This means you're the best supervisor? <laughs> yes. No, because you understand my joke? Supervisor, yes. so maybe you have a cape, but he makes you a supervisor. <laughs> that could be it. How can I help you, though, sir? 
Oh, I was looking for the number for my friend Chaim Adcher Brecher. How are you? How are you spelling his last name? Anyway? Uh, Brecher B R E H H E R. That's B R E. B R E Bre. Yeah. H H E R Cher. S is in Sam. No H as in Brecher. Uh, C K E R. Or Brecher. No Brecher. Okay, B R E. What's the next letter? H. X like what? Xylophone? No. You know Solomon Och? I can't understand what you're saying. You said B-R-E. What's the next letter, though? Ech. B-R-E. Ech. Ech. E-R. R. Okay, I don't... Under, after the E, I, I don't understand the letter after the E. Okay, maybe I should give for you a sentence, a different sentence. What's the word? What's the word that it begins with? I oh, so I, maybe I, if I give you a sentence with this sound also, maybe you know what they... Right? Okay, so I need to know. I need to know how you're spelling the word, though. I apologize. I no, really, no, this is very. Yeah, this is very it's B R E. What's the le- What's the What's the word that begins with the letter? Okay, so I make for you a sentence no. with the same sound. No, no, no. no. Just oh. what, what's a letter that begins up with the word after the E? Ah, Hamotre starts with the same letter. What's that? Hamotre and Brecher also the same letter. H. Hamot- what? Are you saying H? No, Hamotre. Hamotre is like this. Hamotre Brecher went to the store. It's a sentence with that sound. But I can't understand the letter. I really cannot understand it. Oh, I said I said K, I, I said H, and then I, a C, and you said I'll tell you what we can do. I go through the alphabet, and when I come to this letter, I stop. Okay, go ahead. A, I have to think. A, a B, B, C, D, E, F, no, F, F now, right? F, F G, G, H, I, I J, J, K, K L, L, M, N, O, O, P. Ech, fashtanis. L M N O is one letter. No, no, L M N O P. I have mind, since I'm uh, since I'm young, L M N O is a letter. L M N O. Sir, I really need to get this letter though from you. Uh, L- okay, oh, I have other we, customers on the line also. Uh, we go weiter. L M N O P Q R X E E S S T U V W X X X X? Yes. X. Right. Y and Z and X. Well, what's the letter, sir? X. It's X. No, no. no. X was a W, X, Y, Z and X. The last letter. Okay, it's B, R, E. What is the next letter, sir? Oi. It's a brog. X, X, E, R. Supervisor, you, you know. Okay, sir, if you can give me the next letter, I can help you. If not, I'm going to have to disconnect from the phone. Disconnect yes, I his phone? It. Yes, I'm going to... He didn't pay the you, telephone bill? I need for you to give me the, the letter, sir. I'm giving you the number, the letter. The letter? What is the letter, sir? B-R-E. What's the next oh, letter? It's so hard for me. Ech. X? Is it X? Ech. Oi. Oi. Yeah, I need to know. Oi. Oi. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Okay, sir. I'm going to have to disconnect, okay? His phone. He he didn't pay his bill. Thank you.